Well, uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, so I'll be discussing uh, some of our results after we participate in the Sample 6 challenge. So uh, there's a few components to the challenge, one of them being the blind prediction of host guest binding free energies. And this is uh, the part of the contest that we participated in and uh, we calculated the binding free energies via the Abiba force field, which is a polarizable model. Uh, so a few take-home points uh, that hopefully I'll drive home over the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, why um, any of this following work for calculating the free energies is important. Uh, so overall, we're not examining a congeneric series. So we have a very diverse test set as part of the sample contest. Uh, and within the, uh, the guest set, there are real drug molecules. So um, there's a huge variety of molecules that we're looking at. Um, also that within the system of interest, there's different environments, so we can really show off the polarizable model. Um, within our uh, host, we have a hydrophobic interior and the pol um, a polar exterior, and then also calculating the salvation energies of guests within uh, water. And then uh, finally, that the free energies that we're calculating are absolute free energies as opposed to relative um, free energies. So. Um, that we've heard some of the shortcomings of relative free energies. So um, to make a quick analogy that we're not going to be calculating the free energies of taking an elephant and changing it into a rhino, that um, what we like to do is actually disappear the elephant. So um, slightly more difficult and hopefully more accurate as well at the end of the day. Uh, so for the sample sick challenge uh, for the host guest systems that were presented to us for the blind prediction, uh, that the host system was a cucubitral ring, so it had um, eight units that repeated around the ring system, and then the guests, uh, there were 14 different guests that were varying in size and charge um, and um, complexity, so that um, the guests here are what are considered the drug molecules then, uh, and then a series of molecules on here that have some similarity to them. Uh, so the molecules that are highlighted in red were considered uh, the challenge problems. And so for guests 11 and 12, that there was the possibility that uh, more than one guest actually might bind to the host. So that was part of the challenge was, can you predict the correct ratio of um, guests binding to host? And then uh, the guest 13, the oxaloplatin had a platinum in there. So transition metal was supposed to be uh, more difficult as far as calculating the free energies were concerned. All right, so in order to calculate our um, binding free energies that we utilize the amoeba force field, so a polarizable model, uh, and then we first need to generate the parameters for our, um, the guests. And so in order to do that, we followed a typical amoeba protocol. And to do that, we did an initial quantum calculation at what we would consider a low-level theory, so MP2 with um, a pobol-type basis set, to get our initial um, guesses for the multiples, so our charges, our dipoles, and our um, quadrupoles. And then we ran a higher level ab initio um, calculation with MP2, but with a correlation consistent basis set. And then we fit our initial guest dipoles and quadrupoles to that higher level, um, that higher level quantum, uh, the electrostatic potential generated from that. And then to round out everything, uh, we then had our valence parameters uh, via fitting to the quantum calculations um, from the Merck force field, and then also from existing amoeba parameters. So once we had our parameters in hand for our guest system, we can then actually move forward and calculate our free energies. And in order to do that, um, we utilize the dynamic program uh, and the bar program uh, via Tinker OpenMM. And all of these were run on GPUs. And so uh, that I really can't drive home enough how life-changing uh, the utilization of GPUs are within our free energy calculations. Because just a few years ago that we were running everything on CPUs and it, I, I can't even imagine now trying to do that. So um, it's great the enhanced sampling that we can get just by running longer simulations on the GPUs. So um, just to put a number to it, that uh, these calculations run about 20 times faster on the GPUs that we have in-house now. So. Okay, uh, so within our simulations, uh, our host guest systems were placed within a 40 angstrom explicit water box. Uh, we're utilizing the RESPA integrator and our um, simulations were run for 10 nanoseconds. Uh, we did bar to calculate the free energies, and we tossed out the first nanosecond as equilibration, and then looked at monitoring the forward and backward FEP for any type of hysteresis, and this would be the indication if we needed to run any additional windows um, as we're turning off the electrostatics and the van der Waals. Uh, so with respect to turning off the electrostatics and the van der Waals, that uh, we would first annihilate the electrostatics and then decouple the van der Waals, and I'll comment more about this protocol in a little bit. 
Uh, so then we also, um, for the host guest system, that we implemented a flat bottom um, harmonic restraint between the host and the guest. And the distance for this restraint was defined after running a long unrestrained simulation between uh, the, for the host guest system. And then uh, at the end of the day, doing all this to calculate our absolute um, binding for energies then. Okay, so we made our submission to this, um, this blind challenge and then these were our initial results. So uh, we see some encouraging results here, uh, but then we see some huge outliers. And these actually happen to be some of the drug molecules that were in the test set. Uh, one thing that we did uh, do well on was predicting the correct ratio between uh, the guest 11 and guest 12 with the host. So we um, predicted a one-to-one -one ratio for guest 11, and then for guest 12, we accurately predicted that there would be two guests that would bind to the host. Um, so, but at the end of the day, uh, we'd like to see better results than this. Um, so we were wondering what was wrong with our prediction. So were there um, problems with the parameters or were there problems with our actual protocol that we had implemented? So uh, we then went back and looked at our results further, looked at analyzing some of um, the uh, some of the simulations, and we noticed that uh, for one of our huge outliers, guess two, then when we were at the zero, zero level, so where we had annihilated the electrostatics and decoupled the van der Waals, that we actually had two different confirmations for our guest system. So our guest, when it was by itself salivated, took on this confirmation. Uh, the guest within the host guest system at the zero, zero level had a different confirmation. So we actually weren't comparing apples to apples at the zero, zero level. Um, so, uh, that we needed to figure out a way that we could rectify the situation and see better sampling of the two confirmations at the um, fully decoupled and annihilated level. Uh, so in order to do that, we uh, tested a few different things that we could do to change our protocol. So uh, the blue curves here are where we uh, just decoupled uh, the van der Waals, so we still had some intramolecular van der Waals present. And this is where we have our two distinct confirmations at the zero, zero level. Uh, if we then annihilate the van der Waals as well, uh, we'll see the green, um, the green line here. So we're starting to see better sampling of the two confirmations at the zero, zero level. Uh, and what would be considered a final um, solution for this would be if we also then zeroed out a key torsion within the molecule. And so then we get that free rotation around that torsion. Um, so we'll see then sampling um, this red line here, sampling both confirmations um, in the guest solvated and then also the guest and host guest system then. So uh, then to um, resolve the problem where we saw the guest locked in two different confirmations that uh, we decided to continue with annihilating the electrostatics, also annihilating the van der Waals. And then if there is this key torsion um, within one of the molecules, for example, this key torsion here uh, in guess two, that we would then scale this down to zero right out um, during the annihilation of the van der Waals. Okay, so um, we looked at tackling one of the problems potentially with our protocol, so were there any problems with our parameterization? And so what we observed for the q cubitual ring is that um, we were actually observing uh, indentations, either a single or a double indentation of the ring over the course of time. Uh, and this is something that we decided was potentially non-physical because this wasn't observed in any crystal structures of the CB8 or the CB7. Um, so we decided that we needed to figure out a way that we could um, better represent the fluctuation of this ring. So in order to do that, um, we looked at zeroing in on some of the torsion parameters of the q cubitrol. So uh, there's eight repeating units around the ring. So uh, the, this key torsion here is one that plays uh, a significant role in describing the fluctuation of the ring. So um, what we did was we went back and then calculated uh, the, ener um, the energetics via um, DFT of uh, various conformations of this cubitual ring. So the CB7, the CB8, uh, with a single or double indentation, and looked at the energetic differences and then varied our torsion uh, value based on those differences. So our initial submission uh, had the uh, threefold torsion value at negative 0.25. And so there's obviously compared to the quantum, there's um, some huge differences here. So uh, when we look at increasing that torsional value there to negative 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, you see there's better agreement with quantum. Uh, so at the end of the day that we decided to increase that torsional value to negative 1.6 to get better agreement with quantum that would hopefully have a better description of our Q-cubitual ring system. 
Um, this is also reinforced um, when looking at the ring and then uh, pulling it into an ellipse shape. So again, trying to just make sure we're getting this fluctuation of the ring uh, described properly. So we had two different elliptical shapes here. Uh, again, running quantum calculations to get those energetics and then uh, observing that our proposed new torsional value of negative 1.6 is in better agreement with, um, with quantum than what our previous torsional value was for the perturbature of eight. Okay, so uh, that at the end of the day then, um, what we learned from the sample contest was that we need to look at um, reanalyzing our torsional values and then also figuring out there are any problems within our protocol. And so uh, what we did then was modified the um, CV8 torsional parameter, parameter to get a better description of the fluctuation of the ring. And then also um, switched to a double annihilation scheme and then potentially zeroing out any key portions if we had a sloppy molecule. And so uh, that examining the raw numbers then that we went from having an absolute deviation of 2.7 to with these modifications to our methodology having a deviation of 1.33. And then also that for some of our huge outliers, guess two and guess three, that they benefited from this greater sampling of the guess confirmation, as well as um, from modifying the fluctuation of the CV8 to get a more accurate description, and that our two outliers then are in better agreement with us doing it. Yeah, so just to look at it graphically then, um, the, we see that our, um, our outliers are now in better agreement with the experiment. And these weren't just changes, again, that we made to the methodology because that uh, these were just outliers and this is going to just fix this problem, that these are changes to the methodology that we can put into practice for future calculations then and then hopefully be able to um, get this type of accuracy right off the bat when we do any kind of blind predictions. So um, also that eight of our 15 predicted energies were within 0.65 kPa's time norm. All right, so um, now that we have uh, confidence in our model, we think we have a good energetic model um, as far as parameterization is concerned and also our binding to energy protocol, um, that we want to look at uh, moving forward to larger systems. So um, looking at the FXR, um, yeah, FXR that was part of the, um, actually the, the sample four contest where there was prediction of the, um, the binding poses as well as prediction of the binding for energy. So there are um, over 100 IC50s that are available with crystal structures. Um, so looking at um, um, applying our methodology to those systems. Um, also then considering calculating relative for energies with our model um, for the FXR that all of the, um, all the other um, predictions were with relative for energies so to make a good comparison with them. And then also down the line, if that's something that's more applicable to our system of interest, we can look at calculating relative for energies. Uh, and finally then, um, looking at entertaining different sampling options, so whether it's going to be some enhanced sampling methods like OSIW, um, implementing TCG within our methodology, um, potentially looking at hydrogen redistribution, different ways that we can um, cut down on the time of our calculation. Okay, so uh, in the last seconds that I have then, so um, what I started with that hopefully uh, I demonstrated that we have an accurate methodology, so when we're looking at um, a non-congeneric series here, so being able to accurately predict interactions that involve drug molecules, um, we are able to do make accurate predictions when we have different environments within our um, host and our guest system, and then that we're, um, we're also able to accurately calculate um, our absolute um, binding for energies as opposed to just relative for energies. So um, with that, I think uh, in my uh, PI to ponder, and then also if you want to talk any more about the sample contest, we participated in six, and also have results from sample five for um, predicting binding for energies, and we'll have it posted later. So, and thank you for your time. Any questions? Uh, so we're seeing about a quarter of a kcal as far as errors associated with our calculation. So um, when we've gone back and rerun everything with our new standard protocol.
Um, we haven't yet, but that's definitely something that's definitely doable, so. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Marie again. Mm -hmm.